Welcome to Reaction, to Press Review, our weekly show where we discuss the editors from Reaction. We discuss the stories that have grabbed our attention in the last uh, seven days or so with a global uh, focus. I'm joined by Alistair Ben and Maggie Pagano, my colleagues from Reaction. If you're not a subscriber to Reaction on YouTube, just hit the subscribe button below and also go to the site. Uh, where the address is below and you can become a member of Reaction and you get my weekly newsletter, Maggie's column and all sorts of other uh, things from the Reaction team. So I'm going to go first to you, Alistair. Your first pick is from, I think, from the Financial Times and it's on COVID and laboratories and all of that. So, yeah, it's the FT's Big Read um, by Kieran Stacey and Isabella Kaminska. And the headline is why the next pandemic could be lab made, um, sort of provocative headline, but also implies you know, the, the essay actually has a lot of discussion about the potential uh, lab leak origins of the our present pandemic. And it's just a really interesting sort of long essay, which takes in the whole kind of sweep of a, a kind of part of academic science called gain of function research which has suddenly acquired enormous interest and become the focus of a huge amount of worry and anxiety over the last six months to a year. Yeah. And what I find fascinating about it is, you know, there, there seems to be a good rationale on one level for pursuing. So what they do is effectively try and work out where the next virus with pandemic potential will come from. And in labs, synthesize viruses look out for the next you know if there's a h1n1 virus which has 10 mutations in it i mean h5n1 virus h1n1 we we live with h5n1 is the kind of bird flu pandemic potential one they, they look for in 10 mutations time could that go from human to human but in the process they seem to synthesize these chimeric viruses um and and there are always there's always human error potential for tired scientists to mess up or for protocols to not work you know uh, all, all the kind of pageantry of human mistakes and it's all quite terrifying and uh, it's a really good essay because it takes you through some famous ones where someone got their finger their fi end of their finger infected by blood from h5n1 which had been engineered to be better at passing from human to human and then had to like go home and quarantine and it's just like that is <laughs> absolutely terrifying idea yeah. because that has a huge mortality rate in humans and you know if that's transmissible that could be like the plague effectively but what it does raise and this is what interests me is you look at the personalities involved with gain of function research over the last 10 years the way the funding is set up in america and in china and a lot of the personalities who are in a sense covid heroes like anthony fauci you know, some other key personalities in kind of pandemic preparedness work do pop up quite a lot in discussions over funding over gain of function research especially Fauci and there is a you know there's a political argument in the US that went on with the Obama and the Trump administration over gain of function research about what happened when and you know and quite apart from that it's a great story there is the Promethean kind of side to it where you think what are we playing God um, with viruses, have yeah. we inflicted on ourselves uh, this terrible last couple of years as a result of, of doing that in in Wuhan? Um, what's the, the point of doing gain of function research if if this is the, the the outcome? So lots of all these kind of moral yeah. questions. But yeah, it's a great essay. It puts all the it just puts that kind of debate into a really nice kind of sequence. And yeah. yeah. Good piece. Is it a? Do you think, though, Alistair? Is it? I suppose the uh, the concept is really rooted in the idea that if you can anticipate, use science to anticipate um, future problems, you're building in an extra layer of security. But as you said, there's a, a lot of potential for it to go wrong. It does seem to be an area, though, that was underreported before the before the pandemic. And then, of course, there was when when it emerged that this was happening. It's all tied up in what the WHO was doing in terms of its investigation into the real, into the origins of um, of, of COVID nineteen. But this had happened pre pandemic, 
on an international basis with leading scientists, but not really covered. Am I wrong? Um, it, it was there, and but it was covered, I think, by kind of academics after the turn of the millennium. As uh, there are some more skeptical voices who say we actually went over the top with biohazard preparedness. Um, so the anthrax scare, top five most Googled things in 2001 was anthrax. And, you know, in the whole, on the whole world, that's, uh, I think, or in the US either. I'd have to check that or a reader can get in contact and tell me I'm wrong. But remember the anthrax scare it was a huge thing. And people were very worried about this idea that anthrax could be, you know, pumped into stadiums, could be uh, sprinkled over like a packed sports arena. It's, imp it's impossible to do that with anthrax. You, you can't do, you know, anthrax has many properties. You cannot do that with anthrax. So a lot of it was scarce, basically a, a kind of cultural anxiety around, you know, kind of biohazards. And we saw it with weapons of mass destruction, you know, you know all these kind of dirty bomb rhetoric some of which is justified some of which is is over the top actually yeah. so and my theory actually about covid is we have been very prepared for biohazards in the last 20 years it's a major cultural anxiety it's something that people have thought about leading people have thought about institutes have thought about lots of funding has gone into it but that's you know there's there's that's not how risk works the things mm. that actually cause problems are things you didn't expect <laughs> so yeah. I, I think you know we can be as prepared as we like but you know the the big one that troubles me is the idea of a kind of tropical disease um like ebola which suddenly becomes because of changes in climate becomes sort of endemic in wide swathes of the world it didn't before now yeah. you know that sort of stuff and this is yeah might this happen is, or it might not yeah this is tricky isn't it uh maggie for um for media or what might be termed mainstream media by um, by some people, because there's this tension, isn't there, that science is, on the one hand, reporters want to uh, um, report with great excitement, understandably, scientific break break breakthroughs, but then there is this aura of mistrust and this sense that stuff happens in is happening in 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 secret. Uh, but by definition, I suppose a lot of this this, this stuff does have to be relatively. Um, relatively secret. Yeah, um, I was going to, to say actually, Alistair, I thought perhaps you were being a bit too gentle on Anthony Fauci because from what I've read, and there was a superb article in Vanity Fair about six months ago, the big questions over gain of function were that Fauci and others, um, and, and some within the WHO, were funding directly research at the Wuhan lab. I don't know to what extent and that a lot of it had been kept secret. And I believe there are various committees in the States that are going through some of the, the, the information, the correspondence between various parties, and a lot of it's been redacted. Now, I'm not, this is not sort of conspiracy stuff, but I think there are questions. And going back to the secrecy, Ian, yeah, I do think perhaps we need to pay more attention to science writers, actually. And that's something else that the pandemic threw up, wasn't it, that the mainstream media actually weren't great at reporting it and you saw after about six months the science writers suddenly if you remember suddenly appeared in the press conferences um so yeah i think we yeah to need a bit yeah more. there was a there was a switch in emphasis wasn't a there real from switch. political yeah. journalists covering it as a, as, as a white hole in a westminster story to it being a science story shall we move on to your first pick maggie <laughs> we're going to move on to the economy there's a lot to discuss i've got several uh, picks on the uh, on, on on inflation and the Fed and all that sort of stuff. You go first. This is my EC, the ECB story. Yeah. Um, again, from the FT by Tommy Stubbington, and he's picked up um, looking at what's been happening in the currency markets this week, post all the news on inflation and so forth, and the euro has, as, as people have seen, sort of collapsed to a 16th month low against the dollar. And this is basically because people in within global markets uh, realizing that the ECB is not going to be putting up rates. And of course, usually central banks move together in unison. And, and, and Lagarde, Christine Lagarde, the head of the ECB, has made it quite clear that she thinks the tightening of rates would do more harm than good, which is sort of contrary to what's happening within the Fed and we think, the Bank of England, that we'll see some small increases. Um, yeah. So it's quite interesting divergence going on there. 
it is. I mean, my, I, I'm obsessed by central banks at the moment. Maybe that's sad, but I just I regard their 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 power. I, th I think the question of how do you unwind what central banks have done, exactly. or how do you defuse the bomb um, after all of this money printing and uh, and cheap money is 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 going to be one of the big questions of next year with inflation obviously a function of that and um, and rising. So my, my first pick on that was from the Wall Street Journal editorial board uh, uh, late late this week, which is um, Tweedledum and Tweedledee at the Fed, mm. because Biden in the next uh, you know in, in the next week or so is about to announce uh, his choice to lead the Federal Reserve, arguably the most powerful. Um, economic body in the in the world um he's essentially going to announce what's happening for the next um for the next four years and uh, the leading candidates are of course the current chairman jerome powell and the governor um uh Lael, uh Brenier. now the, the it's a really good leader because it does get to the absolute leader or um, british word uh, you know opinion opinion um piece from the editorial board from wall street journal it gets to the heart of what i think has happened to central banks as they've printed more money and become bigger and more powerful and more politically consequential and of course that this is something which arguably begins with the independence of central banks and mm -hmm. um as they've taken on this this this, this greater power They've also started to cast their net wider, and they're not just focused on traditional central bank measures. Um, and as the as the journal points out, well, I mean, Powell has been kind of all over the place, appointed by Trump, then in favor of Biden's policy, sort of in, in favor of everything, really. And uh, both of them have 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 been on climate change, nodded on on climate change, and all manner of other political issues. But you see the see this with. Um, with Lagarde at the ECB as well, it just it's this license to roam into into climate equality, all manner of other areas, and you just I, it feels to me like a very dangerous economic moment potentially, or a difficult moment, and policy needs to be unwound and, and, and adjusted very carefully. I'm astonished that these central bankers have have the time. Am I wrong, Maggie, to range into you know. every other area of national and international policy? I think we need to put them back in their boxes where they um, where they were maybe 20 years ago and just concentrate on the most essentials. Um, but that raises a very interesting point, which is if, well, one, the ECB has not really started tapering um, its uh, stimulus program, has it? Um, but they're terrified that if they were to put up rates, you would see countries like Italy really with such massive debt tipped over and that's what they should be concentrating on. Um, what other tools do they have available other than interest rates? That's, I think, the big question. I'm not quite sure they know. But no, yeah. you're right. They should be sticking to their knitting. And it's, but it's not, there are also, there are skeptical voices saying that even if you do adjust interest rates in an upward, uh, you start to move them up, that it may not make too much of a difference. Yeah. But my, con my concern is they've left it arguably too late. Um, and if you do, it, the inflation now does seem to be in the in the system, doesn't it? And it's you know, it's it's at a high, thirty year high, uh, in the U.S. It's now stuck above four percent and heading for five percent in the U.K. This thing is here. But then there's a story that you wanted to highlight, Maggie, from Morning Brew, yeah, about absolutely. supply chains, which may have an impact on all of this. Exactly, and and that's why people have been hanging on to this word transitory. Um, yeah, it's a good news story, I think, with a rather, um, excuse the headline, won't you? But it is um, supply chains take a laxative, um, and it's fairly um, descriptive. Basically, what they're saying is they're picking up that a lot of the bottlenecks have now eased up. Um, all the big, or several of the big retailers, TJ Maxx and Target in the States have been reporting that they've got full inventories. Um, you know, there was also a chips crisis, which is one of the yep. reasons why cars weren't, new cars were not being made. And that's eased, hasn't it? The, the chips crisis is because of production yeah. in Malaysia and elsewhere. Yeah, and GM now say that they're, um, they haven't got any plants offline for the first time since February. And Toyota in Japan says they'll be back to normal in December. So don't rush out and spend a fortune on a secondhand car. Just wait for the new <laughs> ones to come. But the big, the really critical thing was also, I don't know if you saw the pictures, of the LA port or the harbor 
a few days ago where there's sort of 80 cargo ships all piled up in a traffic jam. Well, that's easing and the containers have been taken off. So I think we'll see, hopefully, that all unwind and that will have an impact here in the UK. Yeah. Do you think, Alistair, politically, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of the coverage <coughs> at, at some point, I'm sure, of uh, what's been going, on at, been going on at Westminster, but is this this cost of living business inflation is this what is this going to sort of drive politics for the next six months a year do you think are voters noticing it and feeling it well they will when their uh, gas their energy prices go up by you know however many percent you're looking at which was already priced in because of the way the cap works um yep yeah i think but yep. well yeah, I, we talked about this or, I wrote a piece after Boris's conference speech, which did not spend any significant uh, intellectual sort of energy on thinking about the cost of living um, and the kind of uh, cascading disruptions that we're seeing across energy markets and in supply chains. So, I mean, I'm, yeah, it's great that we're seeing the kind of problems easing. Um, especially the port thing. I've sort of become fascinated with the port thing in America because it's like Amazing, isn't it? apparently they were trying to trying to do it at the weekend, but um, mm. everyone was like, no, we're not working at the weekends or at nights. Or I can't mm. quite remember. It was a very amusing yeah. bit, but also serious consequences. But yeah, anyway, mm. yeah, politically, yeah. it's, um, you know, you haven't seen that in British politics for, for decades and decades, a consistent series of increases in, you know, in, in basic, you know, industry yeah. bills. Is going to have a huge impact and it may not be apparent now but it sure will be in in six months um yeah I, very yeah. quite a banal observation but it is going to be just there not at all maggie, maggie you referred uh, or alistair there nodded to what's happening in the labor markets you wrote for reaction this week your column was on the, what's been termed the great resignation which is a term mm. which you should you know, explain and but you said you you wondered if something else is going on the great reckoning and this, yeah. this, what is this term the great resignation well it, it came from it was a coined by an american psychologist actually um anthony klotz i think that's correct uh, pronunciation who saw from sort of april onwards in america this is ast astonishing he sort of thought phenomena about sort of four four million people a month leaving their jobs despite there being record job vacancies. And um, a lot of them were doing it uh, because they could and not necessarily going to a new one. And so he, he said the, the, the great resignation um, and, and, and a lot of sort of more sophisticated pundits tried to put, a, I think, a little bit of topspin on it saying, oh, you know, they're all going off. They've seen there's more meaning in life to working in, you know, McDonald's or whatever. Yeah. Um, but actually, the, what I uh, suggested is maybe what we're seeing is the great uh, reckoning, which is that w workers could see there were masses, there were jobs going and uh, they weren't being filled. And you had um, the head of McDonald's and the States, Costco, they were all, you know, desperate for staff. And they were sort of suggesting staff were being lazy, they'd been given too much with furlough. But actually, I think the more simple prosaic explanation is people saw they could probably get more money. And they, yeah. for once, as I said, you know, got a bit of leverage and, yeah. and employers responded. I mean, we saw it here in the UK, didn't we? Tesco had to start paying drivers more, so did Waitrose. Um, but of course, maybe we're in a slightly, um, it's not quite so simple because if you've got inflation going up and that's going to knock out these wage rises. And it also, it, it also then presumably has, a, it, it has an impact at some point on consumer behavior and the yeah. uh, uh, personal psychology. In that, mm. And, and you're, I think you're absolutely right, uh, absolutely right, Maggie, identifying that this was kind of middle class notion, isn't it? Yeah. The great resignation. Yeah. A lot, yeah. Lots of other people without that luxury. Well, they just sort of need to get on, need to get on with it, need to earn and and have an opportunity yeah. to exercise a, a little bit of bargaining yeah. power. But just when people see the cost of things going up that they like, yeah, then and they that can. they enjoy, maybe that's a bit of a, a spur to a spur to to work. Um, and what we'll see over the next. Uh, over the next six um, six months or so, should we go with the next pick from you, Alistair, which is from the front page of the Times on Friday? A news story relating to a hot political topic: immigration. Yeah, so it's a report saying 
uh, that uh, there are discussions ongoing between Albanian officials and the Home Office on um, potentially setting up a, a set resettlement. You know, a, a, don't know what the word is—a sort of place yeah. in Albania where asylum and Im immigrants would be sent for processing, um, mangled, whatever. Yeah, whatever they've described it as. But the, before there was an, you know, I think that it was on the model of this. I don't quite. What I don't understand about this story is where it's coming from. Does is it the idea that Priti Patel has seen what happened in Australia and is convinced that this quarantine system that they put in on a, on an island really works, and she wants that to be a kind of reality here? Again, that's something that people say in the papers, but. Is that what's actually happening? And then you're seeing the debate over first was the Ascension Island, I think, um, mm -hmm. which sort of reminds, sort of horrifying idea. Just, um, just, just reminds me yeah. of Roman emperors sending their yeah. daughters to live on, you know, barren islands and yeah, the Mediterranean. Sounds pretty sinister. Yeah, it's just Very sinister. terrible. And I, th I think, I think I, I the thought, I th yeah, but yeah, I think the to, answer, I think I, the answer I to, I think the answer to your question, Alistair, is. And we'll come on to the politics in a minute, but I know you wanted to mention um, mention Albania and the t the Times, the story's updated in the Times with the um, uh, a few hours later with the Albanian government pushing back a bit, saying that they're not going to um, set up that they're not going to they're not going to be a, a, a sort of dumping a human you know dumping uh, ground for uh, for for migrants, but the talks are ongoing and. I think the truth of it really is that the, the British government is is increasingly desperate because there's a limited amount it can do. And the pressure that they're under, my next pick is related to that, is from the sun. Uh, from the, the, the sun says uh, this week where the and you know the sun says it's always such an interesting barometer of where of how politics is ebbing and flowing and the, and the, and the pressure that's on the government. Um, and it's headlined open all hours. And it really just says essentially um, soft touch doesn't begin to cover it. So the, 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 they're getting beaten up by the sun, which mm -hmm. Downing Street reads yeah. very, very closely. And then the Daily Mail, I'm conscious we didn't mention actually earlier. I meant to mention that the, uh, the Daily Mail has... Uh, had a change of uh, change of editor, but still. So Stephen Glover's uh, column: If the Tories don't <laughs> tackle immigration, a crisis will become a catastrophe. Um, and as, as as Stephen Glover says, does Boris really care? Four days after the EU referendum, he wrote a column in the Daily Telegraph in which he doubted whether those who voted Leave were mainly driven by anxieties about immigration, but says Stephen Glover, lots of people do care, most especially Brexit supporters and Tory voters, not least those in the Red Wall. Boris Johnson would be wise to take much more seriously a crisis, as he says, that could turn into a catastrophe. So they're under enormous political pressure, and there isn't, in terms of the channel, doesn't, I, I know various people have written pieces saying this is how you solve it, but I've, I've yet to see a con convincing explanation of what you actually do if People are pouring over from France at uh, at an extraordinary an extraordinary rate. Maggie, what's your perspective? Um, one one thing I'd like to point out on the you know that it's always seen as this right wing Brexit uh, issue. I, I don't buy that at all. I think everybody, other than perhaps the liberal metropolitan elite Labour uh, in London, uh, I do think most Labour. I think it's a genuine issue across the. Across the board. One, I think we're tackling this problem from the wrong end. And um, we I've seen an estimate uh, that over the next decades, 45 million people will be trying to come into Europe from southern Africa, across Africa, Middle East and, and the East. I mean, I, you know, statistics are always dangerous. But this wave of migration is not going to stop. So trying to sort of put a cap of it in Calais just seems to be almost pointless. There needs to be, you know, a lot of these people are being brought over by people smugglers. And I do know, and, and that in itself is nasty, whether they're genuine or not is sort of the secondary issue. 
And I think that the, the EU with Britain, we should be doing something about cracking down on the smugglers, really big operations. And then you can sort of start sorting out the genuine asylum, uh, people who are seeking, whether it's religious persecution or whatever. Um, I know there's a lot of dispute, isn't there, about how many of these people are, if you like, just genuine young economic migrants, they want to better themselves in the West, or they've kept seeking persecution. Um, but yeah, just sort of trying to handle it on that Calais 20 mile trip across the channel just seems to be the, the wrong way around. So and it should Alistair, be an international on the, effort. On the, on the, the Times uh, story, which is uh, about Albania, you had a, you had a, observation or an interest in Albania. You've actually been to Albania. I have, yeah. Um, I, a few years ago, um, stayed in Tirana. Um, I, I'm fascinated by about Albania. I think it's one of the most sort of laboratory of, of the world's countries, you know, a bit like you just think there's a microcosm there for all kinds of things we talk about in the rest of the West. And, you know, it's a society that transitioned from totalitarianism very recently uh, and a totalitarianism that was probably probably more severe than any other eastern bloc country including russia um so it, it's faced terrible difficulties before that it was a plaything of other powers italy the sort of fascist protectorate and and then there is a kind of long relationship between sort of in english a particular english mentality in albania i think the sort of adventuring mentality the byronic it's a sort of background for byronic you know uh, extremes and but but more but but in a deeper way than that albania is and albanians are very very poorly treated in the west and in kind of the way we talk about albania they are a complete cultural like a joke you know albanians are really so i found interesting about when we talk about you know let's set up a center in Albania. It's like, it's as if, yeah, as you say, it's a sort of dumping ground for people who are, you know, who want to get here and just end up there. And I think Albanians, it's the same, um, you know, I was reading a novel by M. Forster this week where Angels Fear to Tread, which is one of his Italian novels, which is a brilliant, as he, you know, he was great and, and sort of anatomizing Edwardian prejudice and mm. kind of Ed, 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 Edwardian middle class assumptions about the world and to an extent satirizing them. But in Where Angels Fear to Tread, there's the picture of Italians that middle class English people had 100 years ago um, is precisely the same as the one we hold about Albanians now. It's the kind of instinctive thievery, the um, immediate. Uh, reaching for kind of really nasty stereotypes, all that. And I think Albania is a country with huge potential and it's it's a place we should be interested in and within an area which we should have more interest in. If we're going to think about global Britain that involves the fringes of Europe, um, in, in fact, some, one of the most important geopolitical kind of areas in Europe is, is going up from the age, from um, yeah, the Eastern Mediterranean up through up to the Black Sea. It's a really pivotal area. Yeah. But anyway, I'm, I'm going on a bit, but I just thought- No, you're not you at know, all. No, no, it's very interesting. We, um, we, talk, we talked, uh, uh, slightly different, but connected. We, we, we talked um, last week, me and Tim Marshall on, um, on Press Review about the Bosnian situa situation, which um, it's, it's kicking off. Then the Dayton Accords are about to, be, about to be tested. So there may not be peace in Bosnia. There's then the Ukraine situation, which we also discussed, and then there's the problem on the Belarus-Polish border. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the sort of the, the ne near, um, you know, that part, of, you know, Europe uh, and Europe and stresses and geopolitical stresses and strains and old history coming back are about to mm -hmm. matter again. I think we should talk a little bit about the uh, political coverage because, um, and let's just talk a bit about how Boris is being covered. I think in the context of the Daily Mail has announced that it's uh, got a new, um, we've got a new editor, Ted Verity and Geordie Gregg is, is, um, is leaving. I've just been reflecting quite a bit and I wrote for the Times this week on Starmer and Boris is getting you know, such a kicking in the, in the, in the press uh, Maggie, I mean, it really is. It's relentless in the wake of the the Patterson uh, 
uh, business, you know, splash after splash and papers that you'd expect to even be fairly friendly towards Boris, giving him um, giving him both barrels. But then, I mean, I wrote about how, well, you know, whether Starmer feels like a, a, a prime minister in waiting or not, my conclusion was very much not. And there is this there is this vacuum. Do you think it really ultimately all just bounces off uh, Boris or, or, or will he and number 10, will they care about it? Well, they will care about it. And I think the sort of earlier analysis of Boris's way of doing government that he loves the chaos of it. And I think Fraser Met Nelson has sort of put that into print, hasn't he? And I think it's, it's backfired because now he looks bumbling, weak, uh, jellyish, as though he's got absolutely no principles, no ideas. At the same time, he's allowed the whole sort of leveling up agenda to to sort of start creaking before it even got going by dropping off the leads leg of the HS2. There's there's no sort of lead, is there? And your question about does Stummer look like a prime minister? Isn't there an old saying that you put anybody in front of number ten and brush their hair nicely, take a picture, you know, they become instantly take become prime ministerial. So who knows? Um, uh, no, I think it's a really critical time, but there is no contender against Boris. And I think that's what he's got. He's still got an 80 majority. The Patterson thing will sort of tr triple, uh, trickle away. And but the challenge now is he's got to he's got to bring some really serious heavyweights into number 10 to help him put together. I don't know what Michael. I'd love to know what Michael Gove thinks of what's going on. He's just staying he very, did, but, very quiet, doesn't he? Yeah, um, getting on. I, I mean, Boris. I, I don't think Boris think, thinks in terms of strengthening, strengthening number ten. I mean, mm -hmm. I think, uh, and it's back to our earlier subject that you know that male splash, mm. uh, two thousand pound cost of living shock, which is quoting a report from the from the I, IFS. Britons are facing a two thousand pounds a year hit as inflation soars, tax hikes kick in, and interest rates rise. I yeah. think that is ultimately. Yeah. What, that's that, that that's what's going to be the story, I think, barring some other yeah. unexpected story this this winter. That's going yeah. to be the story of the next six months. So I think he is also he's he's damaged by what happened with Patterson in that the the whipping operation collapsed. He has a lot less room for maneuver in terms of doing anything um, of any screw ups mm -hmm. because a lot of Tory MPs are deeply unhappy on the the whole second jobs mm -hmm. business as well and the way in which it's been. Um, it's been handled but i think we wrap things up uh, there uh, this week you're watching press review with me ian martin editor of reaction if you're not a subscriber to reaction on youtube hit the subscribe button below also go to the site address below and you can become a member of reaction you get my weekly newsletter you get maggie's column you get a weekly column from tim marshall and loads of other uh, good stuff from the reaction team. Until next time, thank you very much for watching and listening.